Welcome to the Education and Empowerment Podcast. In this show, our hosts explore success and advancement through education by interviewing today's top leaders in the fields of education, business, and technology in order to provide insight into what it really takes to succeed. This show is brought to you by Forstay, a SaaS-enabled online booking marketplace for student and intern housing. Forstay provides turnkey, all-in-one, cloud-based accommodation software solutions for colleges, universities, and organizations. Learn more at offcampus.forstay.com and landlords.forstay.com. All right, let's get into the show. You are tuned to Education and Empowerment Podcast. This is your host, Bakhtar Lesoyev, and I'm coming to you with an interview of Dr. Wiki Johnson. Dr. Vicky Johnson is the founder and CEO of ProFellow, the world's leading online resource for professional and academic fellowships. She's a four-time fellow, top PhD scholar, Fulbright recipient, and award-winning social entrepreneur. She is the creator and director of Fully Funded, her signature online course and mentorship program for graduate school applicants seeking to find and win full funding. In this episode, Dr. Vicky Johnson and I will be discussing the topic of full funding opportunities and experiences. For our listeners who are considering graduate school and fully funded programs, or are in a position to advise those seeking such opportunities, this episode will be extremely helpful. We will talk about what is the landscape of the fully funded programs and opportunities these days. Why do institutions and organizations create such opportunities? And how can young people take advantage of full funding opportunities and experiences? Are you excited to get started? I am. All right, let's do so. Good afternoon, and this is your host, Bakhtar Soyev. And today I'm joined by Dr. Vicky Johnson at the Education and Empowerment Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be exploring the topic of full funding opportunities and experiences, and a lot of the good experiences that Dr. Vicky Johnson has brought. So without further ado, Dr. Vicky Johnson, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. That's great. And we are excited to have you. The whole topic of full funding and grants and scholarships has long been a very interesting topic. And especially now with the whole pandemia, a lot of what I hear from students and, and scholars, they are looking for ways to, to get such. And it'll be a very interesting uh, conversation today with you. And as we start, I was hoping that you can give us a little bit more about how you got into the field and what brought you to the whole notion of scholarships and uh, fully funded experiences. Sure. Yes. Well, I was an undergraduate back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and going out into the world and trying to find funding for undergraduate study is, is challenging. But luckily, when I went to Cornell University, I was able to get a decent financial aid package. My family was a nurse and a, and a Lutheran minister. So luckily, I was able to go to that school with a really great financial aid package that, my, that Cornell gave me. But after I graduated, I was out into the world and trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. And I was a government major. And it was interesting for me that without any sort of guidance, I just stumbled upon a brochure for the New York City Urban Fellows Program, which is a professional fellowship in New York City government. And I was always really driven. And I was able to get into that program pretty much independently without much help. I worked really hard on my application, got into the program, and I had a really extraordinary experience working in New York City government, really just during and after 9-11. So I was there working in the emergency management office and it was really the springboard. So once I had that first professional fellowship experience, I then started to really dig around on the internet like to see what other fellowships are out there. And long story short, and it is a long story, I did get into uh, the German Chancellor Fellowship. So I spent a year in Germany funded to do a self-designed project. I also did the Herbert Scoville Jr. Peace Fellowship, which is a six-month fellowship working embedded in a policy think tank in Washington, D.C. And then later, after I did my master's, I I did a uh, Fulbright in New Zealand, which is an award for policy practitioners. This particular award was for policy practitioners to do a research project in New Zealand. 
And it was at that point um, when I was in New Zealand, I was offered a full funding award to enter the PhD program at Massey. Now, this was a really eye-opening experience because when the, this professor approached me about the PhD program, I was like, well, no, because I took out loans for both my undergraduate and master's study. I didn't really know when I was searching for, for funding, there really wasn't anything on the internet that I was finding. And certainly, and the schools didn't offer me funding at the master's level. But then the professor said, oh, well, we'll offer you a full funding package if you get into the program, which means that the school would cover my full tuition and provide me a living stipend for the full duration of my PhD. So again, there's another long story here, but I spent really the next 10 years really uncovering this world of full funding at the master's and PhD level. I also was really interested, people always asked me about those professional fellowships that I did in New York City government and Germany and New Zealand. Right. And my husband and I founded profello.com because we realized that there really wasn't a go-to source of information all in all these different and very unique types of funding awards that are merit-based. So that is the story of how the site started 10 years ago and how I got into the field was really from my own experience on fellowships. That's fantastic. And for the listeners out there who may be listening to this for the first time or the whole world of full funding is new, can you briefly tell us what is full funding and is it even possible? Yes, full funding, as it's defined by us and really by others, is it's when the university offers you a funding package that will cover your full tuition costs, plus give you an annual living stipend. Now, the stipends are typically about $15,000 to $45,000 per year, which is, you know, a ton of money. It's not a huge salary, but it certainly is with the tuition covered on top of that, it's a very significant award. So if you were going to go to do a five-year PhD program, that can be anywhere from $200,000 to well over $300,000 in funding that you're being offered. But what people should understand is that the funding really often comes in the form of what's called a graduate assistantship which is a part-time job with the university. So you're working part-time as a graduate student, helping to support faculty in their research or teaching. But because it's a job, that's how you get the free tuition. It's sort of like a benefit of being employed by the university. It's a really great option because many people will pay for their graduate school degree out of pocket, right. but instead you really could get a full funding package. And when I did my PhD, I, I didn't have a dime of student debt when I finished. That's amazing. Yeah, you mentioned earlier a little bit about kind of what brought you into what you do at uh, Profello today. I'm sure we'll benefit learning more about that. So can you shed some light into why you created Profello and what seemed to be the problem and how you're solving that problem through Profello? Absolutely. Well, I just happened to stumble upon that first brochure for the New York City Urban Fellows Program when I was an undergrad. So when I was an undergrad, I wasn't a top student. I had a 3.2 GPA. I wasn't in honors. Nobody was recruiting me for fellowships. I wasn't on anyone's radar as someone who would win fellowships. And in fact, my senior advisor said I had no chance of getting into the Urban Fellows Program. Right. But I did get into the program and then went on to find and win these other fellowships and anytime people would invite me to come speak at a career event or something, they, they're like, how do you find these, these amazing opportunities? You're getting paid to go to Germany. You're getting your projects funded. How are you finding these awards? And back then it was really just, well, I'm doing deep internet research. And it, I mean, when, when I met my husband, he was kind of working more in the business world. I was in the policy world. He said, you right. really... We should create a website about this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> but sure enough, with his support, we were able to create this website. And the problem was, one, I really want these opportunities to be more discoverable. The people who did know about them were really finding them through word of mouth. And if you can imagine, you know, who's in the know, who's sharing this information, it's really people in privileged circles, the people right. who won the awards and their friends and network. Those are the only people that were finding out about them. So for me, the social mission of Profello is to help in the very least, at the very first step, make this information more accessible. Then another thing that we do is a second step is really to help people understand how they can win these awards. They are very competitive and they're merit-based. These are not right. financial aid awards, they're merit-based. So you have to have a really compelling story to tell. Right. How do you tell the story? How do you make the case? And right. there is, I, I have developed a whole framework around that which I didn't realize I had a framework, but that's what I teach now is my framework. 
That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm unfortunate, and just for the record, you know, I've been a Fulbright fellow myself as well. So I know what's it like to go through that whole experience. And some of the questions I personally get asked sometimes, and I read in the news or here and there is, why do these organizations and companies create such experiences? What is the landscape these days? Like, what, why do institutions create fully funded experiences? And based on your experience doing ProFellow and being in the industry, what would you say I should tell them? Well, actually, this is a really good and important question because all fellowships have some sort of social impact mission themselves. So essentially, these are funding awards for individuals, but it's really an investment by the organization to achieve a broader social impact mission. So for example, the Fulbright Awards are these international awards that they give to individuals to study or do research or teach or even do a creative project abroad. And then also foreigners come to the US to do the same. But the award is not about funding research or funding teachers. The award's mission is to develop stronger international ties between the US and other countries. And so it's really an investment in people to create those ties at the most basic and individual level. So when you look across different types of fellowship programs, all of them have a social impact mission. If you looked at the Urban Fellows Program, their mission was to bring recent graduates from all over the country to come and work in New York City government as a way to invigorate and bring fresh blood and ideas into New York City government. There's programs in climate change, there's programs in economic justice, there's programs in creative arts and arts funding. And it's really, if you think about the mission of the funding body, that actually can help you to win the award. Because if you can connect with the mission of the organization, you can tell the story as to why you're a good person that they should investment invest in because they're going to actually you're going to help further their mission. So I want everyone to keep in mind that these awards aren't for you to achieve your personal goals or to change careers. You can do those things, but the real mission is this kind of broader mission. So that's important to know. Right. Now for the fully funded graduate programs, as I mentioned previously, they really are employment opportunities. Mm. So they're basically hiring you as a graduate student to help the faculty do their research and to teach classes and really help keep the university running. Not all graduate students are funded. It's only this certain type of graduate student, people in research programs. So um, again, if you can connect with the mission of why they're hiring you for this work, you can make a better case as to why they should select you. Right. Well, that's fantastic. And I think the framework that you just brought up is a truly a new lens, you know, looking at it as, as an employment opportunity as well, where you can develop your skills. But I also agree with you on the broader mission. And a lot of young people today, they're like, I want to get started. And if they do, what would you say is the first step? Where do they begin their journey? What's the step one? And what's the step two? And what do you find most important? Well, I mean, first, you can always look at profella.com to find these fellowship opportunities. But I would say whether or not you're going after fellowships or entry level jobs or other things, always keep in mind from an early stage how important the professional network is. I know people get really cringy about oh, networking. But for me, networking is not about talking to strangers at conferences. It's really about when you meet people through your classes, through your work, through your fellowships, even out socially, your family members, you should be connecting with them and thinking about their networks. And a great place to really build and sustain your network is on LinkedIn. I, you can use LinkedIn for free. Right. And it's a great way to connect with people professionally. You can put your basic profile up with your picture and your resume. But there, like when you meet people in your classes at work, you should connect with them because really two, five, 10 years later, you'll see, oh, this person that I worked with at at my first entry level job, they're now the director at the organization where I wanna apply for a job or, you know, oh, they did their masters at a program that I'm interested in applying to. And these are people you can reconnect with them and say, hey, remember me from such and such. Hey, I'd love some insights on your experience in that graduate program. I'd love to hear about the mission of this company because I'm applying for a job there. The network is so important and you really should leverage it and use it to get the questions to your burning, to get the answers to your burning questions about, am I a good fit for this job? What do I need to do to be competitive? So use your network. That would be my number one advice for young people. That's amazing. And looking at Profello today, what are your hopes and aspirations? Can you give us a little bit more into how big Profello network and how many people are using it and how do you anticipate growing looking forward? 
Yes. Well, I mean, we as a social enterprise, our mission is to really be a really significant source of information on fellowships and funding awards. We try very hard to kind of be specific in that arena. So we're not listing small $500 scholarships and things. We're not also not listing jobs. We're trying to be specific to the fellowships world because these are really unique and interesting funding awards that can help springboard your career, especially for people who want to work in socially impactful areas, nonprofit world, government world, even corporate sustainability and other areas. So it really is, I really want more people to find these so that we can have more diverse candidate pools. Also, like the, the more people find these awards, the more impact that the organizations who are giving the awards, the more impact that they can make. So it's really about diversifying the people who are finding and applying to these awards, also giving them the tools to be successful applicants. So we try to work with universities to do messaging with them. We still are at our core, a U.S. organization. Obviously, there's really a global need for this information, right. but we're a small organization. So we're, we're really trying to do, first and foremost, do well, helping the U.S. audience and then also international students and professionals who want to come to the U.S. That's sort of our core messaging and, and where our fellowships really come from. But if people in other countries were to, to copy this model, great, please go for it. Brazil, China, whoever wants to (laughs) develop a database, please do. And the way that we generate revenue in order to sustain this mission is number one, we do advertise fellowships. Mm -hmm. So fellowship organizations will um, pay to get their fellowships in front of our audience, which is great because that's content that readers really want. And then I also do courses and workshops and other uh, types of things to give people more in-depth guidance on how to apply. So those are our two main revenue streams. And the more that we can grow that, then the more free resources too that we can provide. Right, right. And when you look at the number of people listening to this episode, we found that about 20 to 30 percent are actually like students and scholars. So addressing their needs, I was hoping that you can maybe give us at least two or three different pointers into what not to do as you begin this journey. Again, there's so much information about, oh, do this or do that, or here's another resource available for you. But what would you say are those two to three things that students and scholars or whoever wants to kind of take advantage of that shouldn't do, so to speak? Yes. Well, number one, I do encourage people not to do the spray and pray approach, which means that you're just going to apply to everything and anything. This includes the jobs as well. It is not a an effective approach to apply for everything, have simultaneous applications going on, because really for any one application that you do, you do need to tailor it. You need to tailor your application, your resume, and you really need to have the time to research the program, its mission, and think about what is your application story. It won't work to have one generic thing that you're using for all of these applications. You really do need to tailor and put really a lot of time and effort into each application, especially for these fellowships. Right. Fellowships will typically ask for something like a personal statement, recommendation letters, all, almost like applying to graduate school more so than a job. I say, don't spray and pray. Really try to focus in on the, the couple of opportunities that are really true to you and your goals. Secondly, speak to current and former fellows for advice. If you find a program, you're like, oh my gosh, this is my dream program. It's pretty easy to find and discover the fellows online. Like I said, if you have a LinkedIn profile, you often can just type in their name and the fellowship and you can find them right there on LinkedIn, you know, send a connection request with a note that you'd love to connect with them for advice on the, on the fellowship. Usually fellows are very open to speaking and, you know, this advice and guidance is, is free. I mean, why not connect and hear from the real experts on how to create the best possible application? Finally, I would say, stop believing that you're not qualified, that you're not Mm. capable Don't listen to mentors that tell you that, oh no, this is way out of reach because this has happened to me. And I see it happening to people all over the world, millions of people. They get mentors who are so concerned about the disappointment and that you'll face from being rejected that they're basically trying to help couch your disappointment. But really what that does when we agree and believe in that kind of negative uh, feeling that, well, you're not quite ready or you're not quite there is that we take that and we carry that that messaging and that negative feedback with us well into our careers. And the thing is, these are just opinions. Someone's opinion of your potential, someone's opinion of your capability is just 
an opinion. And that person is not walking in your shoes. They don't know everything about you. I've seen people who were supposedly not qualified get into really top awards and programs. And these programs are looking for more diverse candidates. They don't want the same you know, person from the same privileged background year after year. So uh, don't underestimate your competitiveness for these awards. And if just because one mentor told you that you're not ready yet, do it anyway, apply anyway. Right. And enjoy the process. It's not as, as bad as it might seem. You might learn something about yourself. I agree. And that's pretty strong. That's really strong. I'm looking at 2020. That's, that's what I personally discovered. I did uh, look into sort of my mission and vision and I did a little bit of audit of, you know, where do I want to go? At one point, I kind of find myself, now I want to apply to PhDs. No, not now. And it's it's such a battle to, it's not, you already have a PhD. No, you already have a master's degree. Why don't you need a PhD? So there's right. a lot of discussion and it's very hard to cut the chase and really figure out, you know, what you want. So I, I agree with you and, and thank you for sharing those pieces with us. Looking at, you know, 2020 and, and pandemia, I've been hearing uh, a lot of good injections coming from the government into higher education. And I've noticed that different programs and, and faculty departments started putting together various grant opportunities or scholarship opportunities to attract more students and scholars and talent to their programs. What advice would you give to young people to be able to qualify for this and, and to take advantage? I mean, considering that everyone's story will be pandemia, what would you say, how can they make the application different and win those opportunities? Right. Well, just keep in mind that at the graduate level, at the master's and PhD level, the funding is not for your financial need. So it's not because you've been unemployed for two years. It won't be because you know, you, you have X amount of money. These are, these are merit-based awards. They're picking people who are going to help further their mission, or as an assistant, you're going to be helping the faculty do research. One thing a lot of people aren't aware of is that most of the funding that's at the graduate level is really for the production of research. Right. And so a lot of the professional degree programs for people going on professional tracks, those won't have funding, like Master of Business Administration, a very popular degree MBA program. Those typically won't have funding. You almost always pay for those out of pocket, even if they say, oh, we're going to give out some scholarships. It will probably only be for a small portion of students, and it's only going to be for the very top candidates. What I tell people is that if you really feel that you need to get a, first of all, make sure you have to get a graduate degree for your goals. Right. You might be surprised that you don't need a graduate degree to do what you want to do. That's what your, why your network is there to advise you. But if you do see like, you know, I really could use a graduate degree to be a senior analyst, to work at an executive level. Well, then I would say look at more graduate programs that offer funding and keep in mind, most of the funding will be in research based programs. Now, research is a skill that I think is valuable really in any industry, business, right. nonprofit, government. Really, if the goal is just to get the graduate degree <laughs> and come out without student debt, why not use get into a research based program? in an area, a technical area that would be of value to the industry that you want to work in. And then, you know, use that because you don't have to get an MBA, a fully funded master's in communications or data science or other psychology even could be just as valuable in the corporate world as an MBA. You would be surprised. So just keep in mind, you really should research funding options because there is a lot of programs that your only option is to pay for them out of pocket. Right. And even with these scholarships and things that they say, I mean, honestly, they're not going to be significant compared to what you're going to pay for out of pocket. That's great. Earlier, you mentioned about the importance of finding the right mentors. Can you describe like a mentor and mentee relationship at Profello? Oh, sure. It's so funny because just this morning I started penning an article on how to find a mentor because sometimes it's funny. I have a paid course where people are in my course to learn, you know, to, to be advised on the graduate school admissions process. And I am a mentor to those folks. I also mentor people casually, people I've mm. known for a long time or people I've worked with. But sometimes I'll get these random emails like, will you be my mentor? <laughs> and they're, they're, I don't know any, I don't know the person. There's no information about who they are, or what their goals are. And so it's like, you know, I need to write an article on, on how to find a mentor because this is not the right approach to someone who's essentially a stranger. So I think people think of mentorship as this really formal thing or that you have to request mentorship or that you have to set up some structure. You really right. don't. You probably have many great potential mentors in your current sphere in work and school, 
but a couple of things, a mentor really is just somebody who's willing to spend some time with you to right. ask you to answer your questions about, oh, I'm struggling to figure out which direction I want to go in. I, I don't know what I need to do to get to this level in my career. I need some advice on how to navigate this political situation at work. Those kind of questions, you do want someone who's willing to sit down for 30 minutes, 45 minutes over coffee and just right. walk you through. And this should be someone who's more experienced than you in whatever area. This should be someone too that is someone that you trust that to, to be, have an intimate conversation with. And so again, that won't be a, someone who's a complete stranger. That will be typically someone that you've worked with, that you've gone to school with, a professor. It can even be a family member or even a friend who could be a peer, but maybe they've already achieved something like a PhD and you want to get their advice on the whole PhD process. So look for mentors who are going to give you positive support in that they have your best interest at hand when they give you advice and that they're open to talking with you and being honest about, you know, what you need to do to be successful, right. but also, you know, look for people in your current sphere, people that, and it's really just about, Hey, would you mind talking to me for 30 minutes about this thing over coffee? And if they say yes, and they're available, I mean, that is a mentor and it doesn't have to be this structured thing. Like, okay, boss, I need to meet with you 30 minutes once a month. This time your boss might want you to set that up so that their calendar is blocked right. for that engagement, but it doesn't have to be this super formal thing. And so don't ask strangers to be your mentor, you know, don't, <laughs> it's not one, it's not going to be effective, but two, the person really should know a little bit about you in some capacity. So like I said, you probably have mentors already in your life that you don't even realize are mentors. Right. Knock and the door will be open. So just finding yes, the right yes. people. Ask and it's, <laughs> exactly. And that's so important. Looking at people who empower you and at education and empowerment podcasts, we talk about a lot about the right people and, and finding ways to empower young people. And speaking of which, what advice would you give to people who empower young people, coaches and consultants and educators and professionals in the field these days and mentors and including as well? Well, I, I have a very strong belief that mentors should not tell people that they're not ready for this or not qualified for that. Everything that you say is, is a personal opinion and maybe is based on your own experience but really, even people that you know well, right. employees and, and students, you don't know the full story of what they've gone through in their life, what they're driven to do, what they're capable of. Really, what mentors should do is just give students the tools to say, look, you want to go to medical school at the age of 40? Well, you can do it, but it's going right. to be this 15-year process probably to achieve that. And that's all you need to do. You just need to tell them how to get from where they are now to where they want to be. And you can leave out the personal opinions about whether they can do it or not. That's up to them. Correct. So if someone, if you tell someone that this is going to be a 15 year process, it's, it's their decision as to whether they can, they think that's worth the effort. That goal is worth the effort. I think you should just, we should just give people the tools to understand what they need to do, what obstacles that they need to overcome, and then let them decide what they, what they're going to go for. And then if they decide, yep, I'm still going for it. We should give them our full 150% support on that. Awesome. That's very empowering. Looking ahead, you know, past 2021 and, you know, as you are experiencing the world today, what would you say is the biggest area of opportunity for young people looking to take advantage of fully funded experiences and programs? The biggest area, I would say, uh, well, number one, I do see more and more fellowships being developed by organizations companies, international groups. So it is a good, you know, it's a good time to look at fellowships and see what they offer. I mean, some people, you know, you might just do one fellowship in your career and that's the thing that you needed to springboard into the next thing. I think it's definitely worthwhile to look at fellowships. In terms of different areas, you'll see fellowships being developed where we have the biggest social challenges, climate change, social justice, international relations, You'll see more economic injustice, all of that. You'll see more fellowships coming in those areas because that is where the community need is. And so if you're someone who wants to work in those spaces, then fellowships are a great way to get your foot in the door right? and to get some experience so that you can be someone who develops a career in those areas. Yeah, I think there's a lot of huge problems that we need to solve and the world needs your skills. The world needs your commitment. There's lots of opportunity. 
Fantastic. Looking at opportunities, you know, moving forward, I, I personally discovered that everything could be an opportunity. And, and kind of as we wrap up, is there any piece of advice that you'd like to share with us about the whole world of student success or young, empowering young people and fully funded experiences? It's my opinion and it's my experience that the world has an abundance of opportunities. I feel like we constantly get messaging about how terrible everything is. The job market's terrible. The university system is terrible. But really, at the end of the day, I mean, the abundance is there when you make the opportunities come to life. This is why I always really nail home the, the networking, how important it is to maintain and cultivate your network and ask questions, and not just your peers, but the people before you, because opportunities also exist where you can't see them. Right. You know, not every job is posted online. Not every uh, fellowship is out there. Funding awards are often hidden, but they're hidden only if you don't ask, you won't find them. True. So if you go do a Google search and you say, oh, there's only three jobs in this, that's probably not true. The jobs are out there. The opportunities are out there, but you need to hit the payment and ask questions. And the more you do that, the better you'll get at asking questions that start to open doors to all sorts of opportunities. I mean, that's been my experience. I wrote a whole article on that about that was my key to success is asking questions, not being afraid of a no for an answer, but just using that as a way to be informed about what's out there. That's fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been a, a very great conversation. Uh, a lot of what you said is a great motivation, and I'm sure our listeners will find them as such. So on behalf of Education and Empowerment Podcast and forceday.com, I'd like to express our gratitude for empowering young people and professionals through this episode. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And for all the subscribers who are out there and never miss an episode, please subscribe to podcast.forceday.com. And if you're curious about what Force Day does, check us out at about.forceday.com or podcast.forceday.com. And Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. Until next episode, have a great time. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Education and Empowerment Podcast. This show is brought to you by Force Day, a SaaS-enabled online booking marketplace for student and intern housing. Force Day provides turnkey, all-in-one, cloud-based accommodation software solutions for colleges, universities, and organizations. Learn more at offcampus.forceday.com and landlords.forceday.com.